Hi, this is Chase Thompson, pastor of First Baptist Church of Central City, and we are so glad that you are streaming this sermon today. We provide these sermons online so that you can have the opportunity to hear and be reminded of God's Word at any time. We also hope these sermons will provide an opportunity for you to share the message of Jesus with others. Basically, we hope these sermons will build you up and lead others to know Jesus. That being the case, please know that our prayer for you is that you would be plugged in and involved in a local church. God calls us to be a part of a local body of believers under the care and leadership of local pastors. These sermons cannot replace that. So if you don't have a church home, we would invite you to come and be with us at any time at First Baptist Church of Central City. We would love to have you, and thank you again for tuning in. May the Lord be with you. Amen. I spoke briefly and off the cuff on this Wednesday night, and on Wednesday I read from Romans 3, 9 through 20. But as you all know, on Tuesday, an 18-year-old went into an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas, and killed 19 7 to 10-year-olds and two teachers. And every time something like this happens, people always ask the same question, which is, why? Why would someone do something like that? What would make someone go and do this? And usually it's a question out of shock, but then questions seeking understanding begin. Was this an individual who was mentally ill? Was this person abused or bullied or ignored? Had this person shown any signs of violent behavior or mentally ill behavior? What were the factors leading up to this? And a word gets used that you don't often hear anymore, even though it is the best word for the situation, and that word is evil. These actions were evil. These killings were evil. This shooting was evil. And some, but not most, will even dare to say this person was evil. Is that true? Can a person be evil? And is it possible for us to commit evil acts? That's the question we're asking this morning, and we're going to be looking at a lot of different passages of Scripture, but before we pray, we're going to read one passage. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. So if you look with me there, Genesis 1, 26 through 31. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Father in heaven, once again we come before you this morning and Lord, we thank you for your grace in our lives. We thank you for the forgiveness that you've shown us. We thank you, Lord, that you have instructed us as believers in Christ that we can cast all of our anxieties on you because you care for us. And Lord, we simply ask now that you would be with us and that you would speak your word to us this morning. God, we pray that you would give us a greater understanding of evil and of the effects of sin in the world. We pray, Lord, that you would give us a greater understanding of the hope that we have in the gospel of Jesus and of our calling to carry this gospel out to others, that they might hear and repent and believe in a salvation. God, we pray that you would speak to us in a powerful way and that you would use this time that we have in your perfect and authoritative word to speak into our lives and to shape us and make us more like Christ, that we could live for you and live in a way that ministers to others every day of the week. 
God, I pray humbly that you would speak your message to your people through me this morning. Lord, as the preacher, I pray that you would help me not to be a distraction, but to uh, present your word in such a way that we would all hear it and respond to it and be changed. And Father, we just thank you again for this time that we have together today. And it's in the powerful name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. The big question that Hannah and I keep asking about our son right now is, who does he look like? And we've got our baby pictures and his baby pictures. And my father-in-law even took uh, Hannah's baby pictures and mine and Owen's and put them all together so that we could kind of look at them all and compare and see who does he really look like. And, and the good news is when he was born and for the first two weeks now of his life, he's really, really favored Hannah. Uh, but in the past week, this third week, things are starting to take a very, very scary turn. Uh, because as his face is beginning to take, gr take greater shape, he's beginning to look more and more like his daddy. And of course, the big prayer and the important thing is that he will act more like his mother. Uh, that's what we're really hoping for. Uh, but seriously, children take on the features and the traits of their parents, don't they? And they can resemble their parents. You've heard the old expression, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And in Genesis, we see that human beings are made in God's image and likeness. And the scripture makes it clear to us what that means. Uh, if you go and read the first 25 verses of Genesis chapter 1, we see that God is personal. We see he is rational, meaning he has intelligence and will, and he is able to form plans and carry those plans out. God is creative. He is competent to rule and reign over all of his creation. And he is morally admirable as we see that everything he creates is good. And so as his image bearers, we human beings were also made to have these same qualities. In the verses that we just read, we see that human beings are set apart from the rest of God's creation. Human beings have a dignity and a worth that is far above the rest of creation because humanity alone was made in the image and likeness of God. Uh, human beings were intended to reflect God's image to the rest of creation, which is why we were given authority over God's creation as God's managers. We are governors or deputies under the reigning king of all creation. And so being made in God's image and likeness means a few different things for human beings. First, it means that we have a soul. If you read Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Uh, this means again that we are personal, self-conscious beings who, like God, have a capacity for knowledge, thought, and action. Secondly, though, it means that we were made morally upright, meaning we were created like God to do good and to be good. Uh, the first part of Ecclesiastes 7 verse 29 says, Behold, I have found only this, that God made men upright. Third, we know that we have dominion over the earth. God is the creator and sustainer of all things while we are God's managers over his good creation. Fourth, our bodies are inherently a part of that image. Uh, even though God does not have a body and God is a spirit, uh, the fact of the matter is we have a body. We were made in God's image and we find that confirmed that our bodies are made in God's image in the fact that when Jesus came, the incarnation of God, he took on a body. And finally, we were made to live forever. God is immortal and God cannot die. And in the same way, mankind was made immortal. And all of this very simply demonstrates to us that God created us out of love. Because God didn't have to create at all. God had no reason to create other than to share himself and the rest of his creation with us. And so we understand that life is a gift. Therefore, people fear death and are thankful to be alive. So when we hear all that, we ask the question, what happened? Because this isn't the mankind that we're familiar with today. 
If mankind was made in God's image, and if that means we are morally upright, we are rational, we have a soul, we were made to live forever, we were made to be stewards of God's good creation, then why does it seem like we don't see any of these qualities inherently in mankind today? Why do we see so much evil, not only in its natural form of tornadoes and famines and disease, but in humanity itself? How can a young 18-year-old become so conflicted that he goes into an elementary school and barricades himself into a classroom and kills children and teachers? Why does anyone have to die at all? Why do bad things happen? And the Bible gives us a comprehensive answer to why bad things happen. Why we grow old and get sick and die. Why it would be possible for a person to commit such a wicked and evil act as we saw this week and as we see far too often. And that answer is sin. Now we know that sin is an archery related term that means missing the mark, missing the bullseye. And so sin is not simply the bad things that we do, but rather sin is when we fail to live as the human beings God created us in his image and likeness to be. It is a total deformity of human nature. And therefore, sin can also be defined as failing to live, act, think, and have motives in harmony with the will and the law of God. The root of sin is pride and hostility toward God. Sin causes a person to be rebellious, negative, and irrational toward God and toward his commands. And the ultimate sin, the ultimate mark against humanity that still strikes at the very core of who we are today is our temptation to be our own God. Sin gives us a spirit of fighting God in order to play God. To be God-like to the point that we feel that we don't need the Lord. The Bible says that the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, were put in the Garden of Eden into a place of perfect happiness and eternal life. And there they were given only one command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It seems that the reason that the tree was called by this name was that the issue was whether Adam would let God tell him what was right and wrong for him or if he would seek to decide for himself what was right and wrong regardless of what God had said. And so by eating of the tree, Adam and Eve claimed that they knew what was good and evil apart from God. And that still goes on in human nature today doesn't it? Today we so often still believe that we can decide what is good and evil all on our own. A lot of people today argue over laws and policies and the foolish idea that many people have is that the law of the land ought to be based on majority opinion. But folks just to give you one example if every single person alive on the face of the earth today suddenly felt that murder was okay, that would still never make murder okay. We know that the same is true for every single moral judgment in the world. The only way we know what is right and wrong is if there is such a thing as right and wrong, and there is. Because God as the creator has set that standard. We do not get to decide what is good and evil on our own. God is the one who has the authority to declare what is good and evil. This is why Isaiah 5, 20 and 21 warns us, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. Who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Adam and Eve decided that they would be their own gods and thus they sinned against God. They disobeyed God's command. They transgressed God's law. They offended God's purity by defiling themselves and thus they stood guilty before the Lord. 
And we know they were driven out of the Garden of Eden, driven away from the tree of life. And eventually after living a life of sin and separation from God, they died. And whether or not they were saved, we don't know. But what we do know is that sin, like a disease, has spread from our first parents, Adam and Eve, all the way down to each and every one of us today. In a mysterious but obvious way, Adam, who was our first representative before God, passed his sin down to us so that each and every human being since Adam and Eve has been born into sin. And what that means is this. We are not sinners because we sin, but rather we sin because we are sinners. We are born with a nature that is enslaved to sin. And I need you to hear that again because many, many, many times people get that confused and they actually get that backwards. But the Bible makes it clear that we are not sinners because we sin, but rather we sin because we are sinners. And this is why someone can commit such a heinous evil as what we saw in our country this week. This is why a man like Adolf Hitler can rise up and lead his country to exterminate an entire group of people just based on his definition of who is truly human and who is subhuman. This is why there is darkness in every corner of the earth so often manifesting itself in abominable ways because all human beings are born in sin and therefore all human beings have the capacity to commit acts of atrocious evil. So why don't all human beings commit atrocious acts of evil? If it's true that every human being has the capacity for evil, what stops everyone? What stops me and you from committing horrible, wicked acts? And very simply put, what stops us is the grace of God. We've talked about this before, but in the Bible we find God showing us grace in two primary ways. The first is what we would call common grace, which is the grace that God shows to every single person on the earth. And the second is saving grace, which is the grace of forgiveness and eternal life through Jesus Christ, God's Son. Jesus, of course, died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. He was dead and buried, but on the third day, God raised him up from the dead so that anyone who turns from their sins and believes on Jesus Christ will be saved. Meaning God saves that person from their sin and he gives them new eternal life. But God's common grace is what holds our world together. Anytime a sinner is spared from death, every moment that we breathe, every moment that the sun doesn't explode, that the earth continues to spin on its axis, that life continues to go on, God has shown us grace. And in the same way, God shows each and every one of us grace by restraining us from our worst impulses. Restraining us from fully exercising our sin. And God does this in a number of ways. He does this by giving us a conscience. He does this by making himself known in his creation. By showing kindness to us. By surrounding us with people like our parents and friends and members of the local church. Who will speak truth into our lives even when we haven't yet been saved. And by setting government authorities over us so that we will fear the punishment that comes from unrestrained sin. In all of these ways, and in other ways that we don't know, God shows grace even to lost sinners by restraining them from the sin that we are all capable of. But nevertheless, this common grace that God shows is not the same as God's saving grace where he saves a person out of their sin, releasing them from the enslavement to sin that we are born into. 
And so sometimes when a person hardens his or her heart and a person begins to more fully embrace his or her sin more and more, that person can come to the point of doing things that would cause us to ask a question we already know the answer to. How could someone do something like that? And the answer again is that every single one of us if not for the grace of God, has the capacity to commit terrible acts of evil. I read this passage on Wednesday and I want to read it again because it's a very bold passage. It's a very blunt passage of Scripture. And some of you read this in Sunday school this morning, but look at Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. Romans chapter 3, verse 9, it says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. It's for this reason that Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20 says this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. That's common grace. Being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. And notice again, we read the first part of Ephesians 7, 29, at the beginning of the sermon, here's what it says in full. It says, Behold, I have found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. Church, God has promised to pour out His wrath upon all sinful mankind. For all of us are sinners through and through. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. And folks, payday is coming. Christ is coming again to judge the living and the dead. And so we ask, how can we possibly be saved? How can we possibly be freed from our enslavement to sin? How can a person possibly come to the point of never having the capacity to commit terrible acts of evil again? Romans 7, 24 and 25 says, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 8, 1 and 2, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. When a person is saved, Romans 6, 17 and 18 says, But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And Jesus said in John 8, 34 through 36, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. When the Lord convicts a person of their sins 
and that person truly repents and believes on Jesus Christ for forgiveness and salvation, that person is saved. That person is born again. That person is made a new creation, enabled once again to bear the image of God in the world. And that person is freed from the grip, the hold, the power of sin in their lives. Freed to live a life of righteousness for the glory of God. And therefore we have to understand as those who have been freed, as those who have been saved, the utmost importance of us going out into our neighborhoods, our schools, our businesses, our community, and sharing the gospel. Because the Bible says the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Look with me one more time to Romans chapter 10 verses 8 through 17. Romans chapter 10 verses 8 through 17 again a powerful passage of scripture with a wonderful hope but also a strong challenge. It says this, But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. Anytime you see those capital letters, that's an Old Testament quote. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Now look at this challenge. Verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him? Whom they have not heard. And how will they hear without a preacher? Now understand preacher there is not a professional minister. It's not a pastor. This is anyone who would carry the good news about Jesus. And who has he sent? He has sent all his followers. Verse 15. How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Folks, you can't make people heed the good news, but you can go and you can tell people the good news about Jesus Christ. And in this dark world that we live in, where people are breaking apart and completely giving in to their sin nature, people need good news. They need life-changing news. They need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is the only thing that has the power to change hearts, the power to save, and the power one by one to turn this world around and bring an end to the senseless evil that we keep seeing people subjected to. So I want to ask you today, would you commit yourself this morning to sharing the gospel with someone, somebody, this week? Telling them that though we are all lost in sin and though our world sees the effects of sin, Jesus came and he lived a perfect life. As the Son of God, he died on the cross in our place for our sins. He was buried. He rose up from the dead. And anyone who will turn from their sins and believe on him for salvation will be saved. Would you tell that good news to somebody this week? And I also want to ask you, if there is sin in your life and in your heart that you need to turn from. 
sin that is crouching at your door, the desires to consume you. Will you master that sin this morning by turning that sin over to Jesus Christ? Will you turn from sin and be saved? Or as a Christian, will you turn from sin and be refreshed in Christ today? Would you pray with me? Almighty God, Lord, we know that we are born into sin. And God, that when sin is left unchecked, it festers and it grows and it consumes us. And so Lord, we pray this morning that you would help us first of all to see how necessary it is that we turn away from all of our sins and surrender them to you. Father, if there be someone here today who's never been saved, never experienced the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, never experienced being born again and receiving the new life that only Jesus can give, God, I pray that you would convict them where they're seated right now. And God, by your grace and in your love, that you draw them to respond to the Savior. Lord, that they would turn away from the sin and selfishness that cannot bring life. And that they would come to Jesus and surrender to Him. And God, for those of us who have surrendered to Jesus, Lord, it is easy for us to allow sins to come back into our daily habits. And God, it seems to be all too easy for us to sin against You and simply to ignore, dismiss that sinfulness in our lives. But God, your word tells us that sin's desire is for us. To destroy us. To eat us. To devour us. And so God, we pray this morning that you would help us to see that sinfulness and Lord, to repent of it. To give it to you fully trusting that you will take it. And Father, this morning we also pray that you would help us to see how important it is that we carry out good news into this lost and dying world. God, we live in a world today that is a dark and treacherous place. And Lord, we see acts of wickedness and evil carried out on a scale that we've never seen before. Lord, this world needs the light of the gospel. And we pray that you would help us to understand that and to go and carry the gospel message to others. Lord, you have the power to transform a society, to transform this entire world. And God, you've given us the gospel to go and carry out your message of salvation and change. And so we pray that you would help us to do that. But Lord, however we need to respond this morning, we pray that you would draw us. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.